Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing five reviews of some Latvian literature. So this is one of my Archive 5 episodes, which you may have seen before. Basically, it means I wedge five different videos together, and you can see the timestamps will be up on the screen and also in the description if you want to skip into an individual review. The books that we are going to be taking a look at today are... Dogtown by Louise Pastore, which is a middle grade sort of novel about dogs in Riga, talking dogs. Speaking of Riga, then we will have The Book of Riga, a city in short fiction, and this is an anthology edited by Eva Eglaja Crisson and Becca Parkinson. This is one that I was sent for free. This is one that I pre-ordered with my own money. This is one that I bought at the launch night for it in, in Riga. This is 30 Questions People Don't Ask, the selected poems of Inga Gale, translated by Yeva Lesinska. This is published by Pleiades Press, and uh, it's a book of poetry. And then we have 18 by Pauls Bankowskis, translated from Latvian by Yeva Lesinska, who also did this one, which is very cool. And this is like, it's a very difficult one to explain, but basically this is set largely in 1918, which is the year in which Latvia was founded as a country. It's kind of almost a cross between like historical and literary fiction, I would say. And then finally, we have Baltic Comics Magazine number issue number 27. And as you can see, this is super kawaii. So yeah, these are the books I will be sharing with you guys today. Hope you enjoy. Today, I am watching... Of course, it is Todd, the Librarian. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be- Hello Biggie, how are you? Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Dogtown by Louise Pastor. And this is illustrated by Arenas Petersons and translated by Zanete Vever Pascolani. Pascolini, sorry. And this is a Latvian book, as you can probably tell. It's kind of middle grade, really. And... What's cool about this is that it taps into legends about Riga, which is Latvia's capital. So I actually pre-ordered this. This is published by Firefly Press. I, I went to uh, stop by them, by their stand at London Book Fair, actually, to say hello. Because I'm really, I've been really looking forward to this coming out, and it was not a disappointment, let me tell you. But I'm going to read you the blurb, and then I'm going to give you some of my thoughts, and then there'll be a rating at the end. All Jacob wants is for a tall ship to sail down the street, right past his dining room window. But now his wish has got him into big trouble. His dad takes him to stay with his grumpy cousin Mimi and Uncle Eagle on the other side of town. It's going to be a long summer. Then he meets the boss, leader of the Dogtown pack, and everything changes. They need Jacob to help them fight tooth and paw to save their home from the evil Skyler skyscraper and safeguard their town forever. Dogtown by Louise Pastore is an adventure story from Riga, the capital of Latvia, where, if you know where to look, the streets are full of dogs who can talk in many languages. The thing where it talks about maps, by the way, maps play a big part in the city, but we also get some awesome illustrations of them inside the book as well. The legend goes that the banks of the Daugava, the local river, will overflow and flood out the city. So the, the kid, the main character in this story, Jacob, he, uh, he, he decides to, to say yes. The city is complete, and then everything goes a little bit wrong. So, he, for example, here we go. Dad, he said, the Dalgava River has invaded the city. Don't worry, his dad said comfortingly. We're on the fifth floor. Nothing will happen to us, although it looks like our car is a goner. He pointed as their car vanished below the waters. This isn't what I wanted, Dad. And basically, because he causes this to happen, he then gets shipped off to live in Dogtown. And in Dogtown, he meets all of these talking dogs, he makes friends with them, and then when there is like a plan to redevelop that part of the city, he teams up with the dogs to try and stop this redevelopment from happening. He's just jumped up. Hey Biggie, say hello. We're reviewing Dogtown, mate, aren't we? What's next, what page is next? Here's another map. Yeah, we, we like this map. We're a big fan of this map. I think what's quite funny here is there's the little, well, little girl in it, Mimi, and she says, princesses are all so silly, doesn't she, Biggie? And it says, Jacob didn't think princesses were silly. In some of the old fairy tales, princesses got saved by heroes, didn't they? If there weren't any princesses, there would be no point to the story. Jacob shrugged. And he said, actually, I didn't notice this until going back through it now. But he said, um, you know, they were talking about what they want to be when they grow up. And he said he wanted to be a planner, as in like a town planner. And that actually makes its way into the story later on as well. What I think is cute as well is that the dogs speak different languages. So in Latvia, there's quite a sort of 
a weird language situation really so a lot of Russian speakers moved into the area and uh, so and this was during the Soviet occupation and stuff like that and a lot of Latvians were actually deported and sent to gulags and stuff like this it's all very unpleasant but the result is that not all Latvians speak Latvian a big proportion of them speak Russian and that's reflected in these dogs uh, the dogs as well not all of them speak Latvian as their language some speak Russian and it actually plays a part again it's a plot device at one point one of the dogs speaks a language that they theoretically should not be able to speak which is very interesting Biggie's main feedback he gave this a one out of five he said he he would have much preferred it if they were talking cats especially because of Riga's cat hotels uh, well the cat hostels where they're like little things where, cat, where the street cats can like go into cellars and little boxes and stuff like that for when it's super cold which is very cute I like there's some bits about kind of morality in the world that we live in the crazy world that we live in so it says here Rich people's houses have high concrete walls around them to keep their riches safe inside. They settle down comfortably and spend their days surrounded by their expensive possessions. Neighbours don't know each other, separated by their high walls, and they all live in constant fear of losing their belongings, always suspicious of each other. One thing I will mention here that you've possibly picked up on from the excerpts that I've read is that the translation is very good. I mean, you can't fault it really. It just reads as though reads like an English language middle grade book it's you know great story very very well written and uh, you fly through it as well we have another awesome illustration I really like Rainus Peterson's style actually it's quite minimalistic but it works really well he's just dude's got style man I believe I read somewhere as well this is actually being turned into an animated film as well so that'd be very cool and something to keep keep an eye out for they start talking about wishes and you know what happens if they come true and stuff so we have this bit here and I think this is great because it's a way of like reimagining that whole you know you see the trope quite often in stories where somebody gets some wishes and they make silly wishes and it all goes wrong and backfires on them and and this discussion here is like a new take on that so then he had a wonderful idea how about wishing for all the sweets cakes and chocolate bars in the whole world to appear before them right there and then his mouth started watering at the thought no if whatever you wish comes true you need to get your brain in gear and i don't think yours is working very well at the moment can you imagine what would happen where would they all go? We would both be crushed. Have you any idea how many sweets there are on the planet? Enough to cover an entire continent. Not to mention the fact that if your wish did come true, Maskatchka would be covered in chocolate and it would take me years to get it all out of my hair and... With the tide of Mimi's chatter washing over him, Jacob reasoned that if he was to try and help other people, he should wish for everyone to be happy. So he should wish for all the wishes in the world to come true. Wasn't that a good idea? Don't be silly. What if someone wished horrible things on other people? Just think of the consequences and it would be all your fault. And then uh, what's his name? Jacob is like, oh, Mimi is insufferable. No, Mimi raises a very good point, Jacob. <laughs> we have this the most tragic line of dialogue I think I've ever read in like a book aimed at children. So this line of dialogue here and this builds on those wishes there. So if I wanted, I could wish for my dad to start loving me again. I actually cracked up when I read that. I don't think it was meant to be funny, but it did make me laugh for some reason. Here we go, we have another cool little map here. Now what I like about books like this is it's just pure escapism, even though it's set in the real world. It almost reminds me of uh, Terry Pratchett, and in particular, his uh, Johnny Maxwell books, which are like the closest thing Pratchett did to young adult, I guess, or to middle grade or whatever. But it has that same sort of vibe of while it is in set in our real world, there's all sorts of little strange things going on. It's like magical realism, but it's not even that. It's very hard to explain it. It's just a real sense of being set in our world, but having an adventure to it. You know, it almost subverts the fact that basically the world is really boring and nothing much happens, and this book kind of subverts that, which I like. It, it, it makes things like planning permission really exciting. <laughs> I think this this paragraph here as well is, is pretty cool because it kind of gives you a feel of what this proposed change potentially is. But equally, one of the big things in Latvia and in the national psyche is this desire to kind of reconnect with nature. I mean, they celebrate Midsummer and, and all that kind of stuff, for example. It's very kind of... They're very in tune with the planet and the planet's needs. And so I think this paragraph is interesting because it kind of covers how modernization can sometimes go directly against the planet you know it's a war between the future and 
the world we live in. As they glanced around, Jacob and Mimi noticed that other signs had been put up in nearby backyards and gardens. Right now they were full of lush greenery, but it seemed like they were somehow waiting for their doom among the spread of tarmac and cement. Yet more signs showed shopping centres taking the place of the lovely old houses, shopping centres identical to the many others dotted around Riga that Jacob had visited with his dad. Other illustrations showed Maskatchka quite changed from how it was now, no longer brimming with joy and life but instead as dead as the forest, which had been felled right down to the very last tree. The shiny skyscrapers on the signs only made the spooky feeling worse. There was not a single tree, lawn, park or garden in any of the illustrations. No children playing on the streets, and definitely no packs of talking dogs. There was not so much as a cat lazing behind a skyscraper window. The whole scene looked unwelcoming to any form of human or animal habitation, the only sign of life being the all-seeing eyes of the security cameras. I mean, in terms of its imagery and stuff like that, and again, the way it does tie into this national consciousness, it's... It's quite interesting to have it that, you know, to be able to analyse a middle grade book that deep. I keep saying middle grade, I really don't know too much about classification systems, but I think that's what this is. Oh, I did have this problem, which I should definitely mention. There's like a weird printing issue. I don't know if this is even picked up on the camera. Can you see how the lines are kind of reprinted very faintly beneath? Do you see that? And that's not, that's not like bleed from the other page, because you can see it's the same words just published like it's a bit blurry i don't know what's happened there it, it, looking at it it reminds me of the effect of like looking at a uh, you know a 3d video without wearing the glasses where you can kind of see it twice i think it's just a printing error and this is like the first print run like i say i pre-ordered it but it's just a bit of a shame really very cool drawing of a pirate ship yeah, so Jacob's forced to confront hunger and the fact that not all people can afford to eat. And I think that's an interesting thing to include in the kids' book. So it says here, What a horrible thought. There were people who lived for a whole week with the same terrible hunger pains that Jacob had felt that morning for the first time in his life. Grandad moved his tail meaningfully, maybe saying I agree, but then again, maybe not. Oh yeah, then there's a big twist when we find out who the guy behind all of it actually is which I'm not going to reveal to you guys. I'm going to read you some of his dialogue, though. He says, uh, I'm building the future, don't you see? And I have a schedule to respect. I have to do it now, as soon as possible. Do any of you, for example, have a business plan? How are you going to pay for your education? Do you have pension plans for your retirement? How are you going to reduce unemployment? What kind of furniture are you going to demand for your home? And then he's... Uh, he talks about how they're trying to stop him, like this dog. It's very Scooby-Doo, this bit, really. But it says, My project would fail completely just because of a handful of scruffy, runaway performing dogs and a few old shacks. What a loss! And no compensation. My father will be most displeased about this. He was more proud of me in this project than any idea I have ever had before. Quite honestly, he usually doesn't even remember he has a son at all. Once, he and dear mama forgot all about me and I was left at school. That was when they decided I desperately needed a chauffeur-driven limousine and bodyguard. My father is responsible for very important affairs of state, you see. Thank goodness my bank account isn't overdrawn. Then he start, there is talk of a new business plan, and I just love this little illustration. And then we have this delightful little drawing at the end. So yeah. So there are my thoughts on Dogtown by Louise Pastore. It's now rating time, and I am going to give it... A four out of five. It was very solid, uh, like middle gradey children's book. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell that this had been translated, which I think is a mark of good translation. It's also got these fantastic illustrations in as well. There are a few bits here and there that I didn't like so much, but again, I am an adult reading a book aimed at a younger audience. But all in all, I mean, if you've got kids or if you are a big kid yourself, I heartily recommend this. Dogtown by Louise Pastore. So anyway, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if not, whether you're going to be picking it up. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more bookish videos and I will see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Book of Riga, a city in short fiction, and this is edited by Eva Eglaja Crisson and Becca Parkinson. So I'm going to read the blurb here and give you a little bit of information, and then we'll dive in a bit deeper. So I guess what I want to mention here is that, so it says here, published with the support of the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Latvia and the Latvian Writers' Union, and the writers include Pauls Bankowskis, Ilza Jansson, Arno Junza, 
Sven Kuzmins, Willis Lasitas, Andra Neberger, Gondega Repsa, Desa Ruxane, Christine Zalva, and Juris Zvigsdins. And I'm sure I got loads of those wrong, but, you know, I tried my best. And so, this was actually sent to me uh, for, for a review but by somebody, I think maybe Becca herself, Becca Parkinson, one of the editors, I think maybe had, had read about my trip to uh, Riga. And, uh, or maybe seen one of my videos and just reached out to me and asked if I wanted to read it. And of course I said yes, because I'm trying to read more Latvian literature. So the blurb here on the back. A suicide attempt staged to attract as much attention as possible from the top of St. Peter's Church quickly evolves into an outlandish and absurd televised spectacle. When a PA is invited into her boss's office one day to observe a protest unfold, just as he predicts, in the streets below, she begins to suspect his power of foresight might extend beyond mere business matters. Finally moving into the house of her dreams on the island of Kipsala, a single mother discovers a strange affinity with the previous occupant. Riga may be over 800 years old as a city, but its status as capital of an independent Latvia is only a century old, with half of that time spent under Soviet rule. Despite this, it has established itself as a vibrant creative hub, attracting artists, performers and writers from across the Baltic region. The stories gathered here chronicle this growth and ongoing transformation, and offer glimpses into the dark humour, rich history, contrasting perspectives and love of the mythic that set the city's artistic community apart. As its history might suggest, Riga is a work in progress, and for many of the characters in these stories, it is the possibilities of what the city might become, more than merely what it is now, that drives the imagination of its people. So, as you probably gathered from that, this is a short story collection. I actually think it's a pretty good way to get into Latvian literature, because you get to see kind of a nice variety of different writing styles and topics as well. The foreword here is written by Vera Vika Freiberger, who was formerly the country's prime minister, which I think is very cool. Uh, I think I think she was probably the first female Latvian prime minister. And um, yeah, we've got some great stories here. So we've got, for example, The Hair's Dedication by Juris Zvergsdins. So this was translated by Marta Zimelis. Oh yeah, this was all about the guy, this guy, uh, you heard it on the blurb, this was the guy with a suicide attempt designed to attract as much attention as possible. And um, basically, he, well I'll read you a little bit here. He says, I wandered aimlessly through Riga looking for a place, the right place, the Freedom Monument. One guy already shot himself there. Does anyone still remember his name? The Vansu Bridge? No, perhaps not. They tricked me into coming down. They have enough money in their budget for that, you see. And basically this is, again, this this guy, he wants to commit suicide, but he also wants to be heard, if that makes sense. I like as well, it said, um, he, he got asked his name, he got his, asked his name and he said, Janice, what other name can a Latvian have? Oh, so Janice means hair in Finnish. And in Latvian fairy tales, the hare is a signifier or representation of cowardice. Then we have The Birds of Kipsala Island by Desa Ruxane. In terms of genres of these, it's kind of hard to classify them. They're, I would say they're somewhere between contemporary and literary fiction, you know. And they are very grounded in the place. So they're very grounded in Riga as a city. Which for me was fascinating because obviously it's not been long since I've been there. So I could kind of like, for example, that bit about the Freedom Monument. I've been to the bottom of the Freedom Monument. So I could start to imagine some of these different things. And even, uh, so Kipsala Island, it said, this is, uh, it's on the other side of the Daugava, I think, which is the local river. And... I think it said it's like half half a mile from Riga's old town, but they don't consider themselves to live in Riga. They consider themselves as islanders, which I thought was just interesting. We have here The Shakes by Sven Kuzmins, translated by Zanetta Vever Pasqualanani. This, what, this opening paragraph does make me think of me. I'm going to read that out. So, from very early morning, Agnia found herself victim to a hard-to-explain, almost irrational anxiety. Everything had seemed to be going so wonderfully. No complications at work. Mr. Jensen was happy with everything, no health issues, her body weight was ideal, the new apartment light and spacious, her financial situation more than satisfying, and yet somewhere underneath it all, a tiny cell was hiding, Agnia referred to it as a cell, which wouldn't let her relax. Perhaps it's all down to the changeable weather, she reflected, searching for an explanation while sitting at the breakfast table, unable to concentrate on the book which lay next to her. Her glance kept returning to the start of the passage. Having been accepted into the elite, Gnecht's life was elevated to another level. He had made the first, the most decisive, step in his growth. 
Realising that she would make no such progress, Agnia closed the book and put it in her bag, poured the dregs of her coffee down the sink and left for work. Yeah, I just enjoyed this story. I enjoyed all of these stories. I mean, it's like any any short story collection, really. How about I rate it now? It's a four out of five. Every short story collection is. Like, there are some stories that I really loved and some that I didn't like as much. And overall, it was just a pretty good story collection. Like I say, if... If you want to get into Latvian literature, this is probably a good way to start, I would say. I would say start with either this or just go ahead and take the plunge and just read uh, Soviet Mill by Nora Xtena. We have West Side Garden by Gundega Repsa, translated by Keja Stramanis. What I liked about this one is this one mentioned, uh, like, just a uh, like throwaway mention to uh, meeting with a gynecologist. I actually really liked the way it was done, like... It's we, uh, did, there was a thing I watched on BookTube a while ago about H Hannah Tay was saying kind of um, you know where are all the periods in literature and gynecology appointments are another thing that are a reality that just don't get mentioned in literature so I liked seeing it here like I don't know if that makes it if that sounds weird that I enjoyed seeing it there but I'm gonna read this paragraph anyway why not I don't want to talk about myself I'm not used to it what I can say is that I'm 30 years old I'm quiet reserved. I work as a nurse in a polyclinic. I don't really have any girlfriends unless you count my hairdresser, my gynecologist and my tailor, all of whom I see according to a strict schedule. The hairdresser 24 times a year, the gynecologist 4 times, the tailor 2 times. So I'm social 30 days out of 365. And I like that because that's exactly how I think about things as well. And I am a creature of habit and routine as well. We have Killing Mrs. Cecilia Bokes by Anna Yunza, translated by Kaija Strumanis. I think this was the one that I, I didn't really understand what happened in this story. I also want to I want to shout out each of the stories as well, even if it's just brief. So then we have Wonderful New Latvia by Ilza Janssen, and this is translated by Suzanne McQuaid. And, uh, oh, this one is a lot about the uh, Na National Library, which I liked, because, again, I saw that as well. And also, it was a controversial building when it was built, so it says here, They had started to build Katrina's current workplace in the plot where the torn-down buildings once stood, but as soon as the old buildings were demolished, those in charge reconsidered. It was a shame to allocate such valuable real estate, practically right in the centre of town, to something like the Castle of Light, even if it was a national icon. They even conducted a national poll. 99.5% voted that it would be better to have office space in such a great neighbourhood. Here it's always been customary to do what the nation wants, and so they decided to modify the plans and the new design would include office space inside the Castle of Light. They even formed a special committee, the cream of the crop, and announced another design competition. We have The Girl Who Cut My Hair by Kristin Zelve, and this is translated by Yeva Lasinska. And I think it was Yeva Lasinska who translated Soviet Milk as well. We have A White Jacket with Gold Buttons by Vilis Lasitis, translated by Uldis Balodis. And we have Where I Am by Andra Neyberger, translated by Uldis Balodis. I like this one had a line in it which I really liked, which is that Winters in Riga are so long and dark that they seem to be almost endless. And I can really imagine that, so when, when I went along, I suppose it was spring, but it was early spring, kind of winter turning into spring. But... I mean, I don't like winter myself much, or I kind of say I do, I say it's my favourite season, but I don't think I do, I get really bleak about it and all the darkness and stuff, and I just can't imagine what it would be like to to kind of, you know, to go through a winter where just the, the temperature is constantly below freezing for months on end. What else have we got? We've got The Night Shift by Pauls Bankowskis, translated by Marta Zemelis. I really enjoyed this. I also like as well at the end we've got about the authors and as well as about the authors we also have about the translators which is very important too I think. I was very happy to receive a copy of this and if you're interested in getting into Latvian literature then this isn't a bad place to start. So yeah there's what I thought of The Book of Riga by edited by Eva Iglesia Christon and Becca Parkinson. Four out of five. Very nice. And on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you want to check this book out. Hit that subscribe button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that like button as well. And I will see you soon for more bookish stuff. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Hi guys, Dane here. And welcome back to Latvian Literature Week, as I guess I'm calling it. And uh, today, I'm going to be doing a quick review of 30 Questions People Don't Ask. And this is the selected poems of Inga Gale, translated by Yeva Lasinska. 
I apologize if I get any of the pronunciation wrong. I, I am bad. I can barely speak English, to be honest. So this is a collection of poetry uh, published uh, by an American press, Pleiades Press. It's part of their translation series. And um, I'm going to read, I've got a few quotes here on the back about her work and uh, her author bio as well. I suppose her author bio is a good place to start. So Inga Gale is an award-winning poet, novelist, playwright and theatre director. She has published four collections of poetry, two collections of poetry for children, four plays and one novel. She has won the Latvian Literature Award and the prize from the Poetry Days Festival in Latvia, among many other honours. In English, her work has been featured in international journals such as Pleiades, Drunken Bow and Edinburgh Review, and in the anthology New European Poets. She regularly performs her poetry at international festivals, such as the Hay Festival and the London Book Fair. Her poems have been translated into Bengali, English, German, Lithuanian, Spanish and Swedish, and she has translated the work of Russian-speaking poets into Latvian. She lives in Riga, Latvia. I went along to the launch night for this actually, so I got to meet the author as well. In fact, let me show you, I did get it signed. It says, uh, Hi Dane, thanks for coming Inga. And then it is dated, which was the 9th of March, 2018. Uh, I'm also gonna read the bio of Inga's translator actually, because I thought this was interesting. Jeva Lasinska studied English at the University of Riga. From 1978 to 1987, she lived and worked in the USA, studying at the Ohio State University and the University of Colorado, before moving to Sweden in 1987 to work as a freelance journalist and translator, at the same time as following the Master of Arts program in Baltic Philology at the University of Stockholm. She now lives in Riga and has translated the poetry of Seamus Heaney, Robert Frost, D.H. Lawrence, Ezra Pound, Dylan Thomas, T.S. Eliot, and various American Beat Generation poets into Latvian, which is pretty cool, if you ask me. So here we go. So uh, Pleiades Press is based in Warrenburg, Missouri, for those who are interested, for my American viewers, I suppose. And um, as usual with when I read a poetry collection, what I am going to do is I'm actually going to go through and read you some. Obviously, I'm not going to read you any in Latvian because I can't read Latvian, but um, I can read like two words in Latvian, actually. So... You know, if it says thanks or time, I've, I've got it covered, <laughs> but otherwise we're screwed. What's interesting about Latvian literature is that most of it is informed by the past. You know, there's a strong kind of cultural tradition. There's lots of folklore and folk songs and that kind of thing that can then be reinterpreted. But at the same time, there's also the history of the country. So uh, the German and the Soviet op uh, oppression of the country, things like them re-establishing their independence just after the fall of the Soviet Union. When you walk around in certain areas, you can see where, you know, the buildings are still run down because, you know, they fell into disrepair during the Soviet occupation and there's been no money to repair them and that sort of thing. And at the same time, there's also, you know, really beautiful parts of the city as well. But it's, um, the, the poetry is a bit like that as well in that it's hopeful for the future and it's, you know, mo Latvia as a country and obviously Inga as a poet and a person has moved on since, since the Soviet oppression. But at the same time, there is still that sort of subtle undertow there as well. Anyway, what, what did these guys say? This is Wayne Miller. He said, The poems of Inga Gale offer an urgent and at times mythic vision of the self trapped inside the claustrophobic press of history, nature, technology and conflict. And yet the speaker's tone is often conversation, casual, even as she remains steadfast in her desire to write the world, no matter how impossible that task might be. Just when the poems begin to feel timeless and elemental, built of snow, blood, beast, sex and violence, an iPhone shows up to locate us clearly in our present moment. This work is deeply original, virtuosic in its use of metaphor and its complex engagement with global politics and utterly of the 21st century. Born of a hopeful longing for meaningful human connection coupled with a suspicion that such connection has too often become impossible. So he basically said what I just said before that, except he said it in a much, you know, <laughs> a much more academic way, I guess. No, a more, I don't know, you know, a more linguistic way. I, I tried to keep it simple for the people. Okay, uh, E.J. Coe said, Inga Gale's poems recenter subjects of feminism and gender. The collection is a haunting of Zergu pasts, myths of half-child bears, voices of buried daughters in relentless lines of heart-beating rhythm and no-nonsense questions digging into protest. Repetition becomes the site of trauma and recovery. 
The poems perform tragedy on stages of forest churches and icy tongues. Between daughters and mothers and grandmothers, the poems show life as it exists, as both miracle and fog. It is with mathematical precision that she unfurls wounds of history, criticises emotional sincerity, and complicates witness and testimony. So I'm going to give this my rating before I go in and read some poems, but before I do that I wanted to mention just a few other little bits. One thing that is a negative is um, it's one of the covers where it's a shiny glossy cover and I don't know when this happened but part of it sort of peeled off by the time I actually got to to make in the review unfortunately. I do like the cover though, the cover's pretty cool. So one thing I do like is that if you look here you'll see the poems are presented in English and in Latvian side by side so if you only read one language you can just read the language that you yourself understand. But if you read multiple languages, if you read both languages, you can actually kind of compare the two of them and, um, you know, almost, I don't know, see how closely the translation is done. Because this is one of the things that we talked about a lot while we were over there, especially when we were meeting with translators and with the poets, is that it's very difficult to do a direct translation and really in any language because even little things like especially in poetry words will have two meanings or uh, there'll be metaphors or whatever that that don't carry across when you translate it into a different language so a really basic example of this is the song do has by ramstein and in english that title means you have but it can also be represented as you hate depending upon the pronunciation and it's part of the wedding vows and so the idea is it's like you have me but you hate me a kind of complicated metaphor on the wedding and, and in English it would just be called you have them and it wouldn't really have that same meaning and so a lot of the lines are like that and it's, so it's very difficult to translate them and we talked about whether even they're almost interpretations of the original poems that I kind of said it as they're like um, it's a bit like a cover song of a song so they're very good approximations but they're not the same as you would get if you could read the original in, Lat in Latvian. In, su in some places I think you can tell that it's been translated, but in kind of a good way, I think it actually adds a sense of the, you know what I mean, it adds the poem, it makes the poem feel more of the place it's written in, if that makes sense. So it's in the same way as if you had, I don't know, a French writer who wrote in English. They'd occasionally drop in a couple of French words into the, their text because they're writing about Paris. So it makes sense to call it, you know, La Promenade or whatever you want to, whatever you want to do. But um, like I said, I'm going to read some of these to you. And so you'll get to see for yourself anyway, the quality of the translation, which I was very impressed with personally. So anyway, I'm going to rate this and I gave it, I think I gave it a, I gave this a four out of five, I think. So, um... But it's one of those, I think, where actually, if I were to reread it, I'd continue to get more and more out of it. I also think I got quite a few of the little references in it. I kind of understood because I did spend some time in Riga and I went around some of the museums and we had sort of guided tours and stuff. So I got to understand a bit of, you know, a bit of the... Well, as I was saying earlier, I got to understand a bit of the history of the country and all the folklore and things like that and the traditions that then informed the poetry, so I could kind of interpret it slightly more. Yeah, I thought it was lovely. It was it, it was quite bleak at times, but I like bleak as well. So, um, yeah. So anyway, this is called Fog. Look, this is fog, sweetheart. Real fog. Look, what you have in your hands is a damp, wrinkled map. Look, here's the turn that would have taken you to the checkpoint. Look, here's the boy you won't be able to look in the eye now. Look, here's autumn, leaves rustling underfoot. Look, here are your friends at the bar who have no idea what to do with the photos you gave them. Showing a man on his knees before a 12 year old girl with her pants down. Look, this is fog, kids. Real fog indeed. Look, here are people who will never be able to look you in the eye. Look, here's the earth and see, you can already safely say it. You stand, you grow, you learn to control your panic attacks. You become a bridge, a tree. You learn to look people in the eye. You make friends with people without arms and legs because you think they understand you. You write this poem, sweetheart, for the thousandth time, hoping that one day it will vanish. Look, this is fog, kids, real fog. Streams of snot and sperm, a solstice of tears. And I emerge quietly by the church in the forest. Eons have passed and I'm still wearing the same sweatpants with the broken elastic and people look at me and some say Well, really couldn't she write more tactfully a little more decently? But if you ask me I say fuck it children don't need to know 
that the world is no bed of roses. Fuck it, I say. Why the fuck do you have to be so tragic? We liked you better before when you drank a lot, lost and gained weight, and fucked anyone who gave you the time of day. So get down here beneath us. That, that is some fog, kids. It's really quite some fog. And I have nothing else besides this worn out, acerbic, sinewy tongue, and the fingers that write these words on the screen as though on a vast lake. I'm emerging from the forest, and I ask you kids, you in your family summer houses, living rooms, in the backs of cars, in your conjugal beds, you children of all sexes, in some sauna, drunk and drugged, you kids who have survived. I tell you it's scary for sure, but still, please come out once and for all, or wait a little, be gentle with yourselves and I will begin to try to breathe quietly here. Well, as you can tell if you've watched any of my poetry videos in the past, it's kind of my kind of poetry here. <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate, I think, uh, in Inga's style isn't for everyone, but I do think for people who are into more modern kind of poetry, I, I think, uh, and especially, you know, prose poetry in free verse, it's pretty powerful stuff. So this is called For Zergu Pasts. And it says here, Zergu Pasts, the horse post office, a building in Riga, now houses a theatre which in the 19th century served as a post office delivering mail by coach. How strange that room with worn black floorboards where, pouring through the window, curtains wave. A cactus on the windowsill has bloomed, calling out from behind the door. Horses march. How strange that room. You enter barefoot, remembering everything was like that. You were embarrassed, angry, red. The deck was rocking under your feet. Everything caused pain, every touch, and every life spoke in bass to you. And all the streets were arteries that brought friends to your heart. How strange, time has clothed us, shut us, it has saluted us. Everything whirls in a waltz, it has all has broken up into shards. Yet once our feet were bare, yet once we were on fire. We were so tired, so young, we were all coughing, and we were among strangers. And they were all ours. Morning woke the night, smiling through the wind. How strange, it was just now. We walked in so angry, barefoot and red. We walked in and did not see the windows and curtains that waved goodbye to someone. Everything ached and screamed, and joy was like a waterfall that flowed across the street. And friends got into the boat and screaming sank with it. A painful, stinging morning came out of a lilac night. How strange, it was just now, that road from windowsill to courtyard with the verdant horses, where kisses stung and wouldn't let us go. And now we're back, this very same room, a river flowing steadily, calmly in the window. And as we entered, others blow their noses, and they spit in some salute. But the window is still, the window is still open. I really like that line, joy was like a waterfall that flowed across the street. What a great line. <laughs> I'm angry, I didn't come up with that one. This one is for grandma, not, to be clear, not for my grandma, it's called for grandma, yes. My grandma is such a proud calling woman. She doesn't join other old ladies who sit on the bench, and she hides the private life she bought for one third of her pension. That's how proud she is. And everything hurts, her eyes, stomach, hands, her hair hurts, her feet and her heart hurts, for the bench does not come to her, and her daughter only comes when she says, I need money, and her grandchildren address her with the formal jus, i.e. the one grandchild who talks to her, and life has settled down as heavy as a whale on her bed, panting, I am, I am, I am. And that woman who is taking me by the hand to the house where I am afraid of everything, claiming, It's okay, it's okay, they are not at all right, it's not really grandma. For grandma has breasts like a caryatid and a white ruffled cap. Grandma is a sales lady and she will sleep with those ashtrays if necessary, if there's no other way, she will. And let those wrong children go out in the world, let them, she will go wash up. She falls down by the bed, in her head a red quivering flower slowly opens and she glides over the Leopardia beach. Two braids tie her down like cables. They tie her down so she can't move. Ahead is the sea swell. It's freezing over. It's freezing over. Past the ice she'll reach the place where her pride will no longer harm her. The flower blooms, her fingers ice over. Someone is coming over the sea. Someone is coming and there is no immortality here. It all turns out to be different. Not that she ever believed that she would be reborn as a cat or a snowdrop. Not that she ever believed that over the city she would swing in the wing. There is just that pulsing in her fingertips and temples. 
What was it? What was it that I didn't have time for? And night darkens quietly over the room. The air solidifies into a headstone of granite looming over the large woman. There is no sound, no compassion, just silence, no light at the end of the tunnel. And from the open faucet in the polished white bathroom, water pours softly, stubbornly, without making a sound. The water fills all the rooms, determined finally, bursts open the window, and she sails out like a ship. The moon brightens her final journey, and from above it may look like she's laughing, my grandma, the ship that never managed to come close to me. She sails, invisible to all, and she will reach the coast where, humming quietly, flowers and cats will greet her. I lie on the birthing table and scream. The waters pour out, she has reached her destination. And the two of us walk through the park, my daughter's hand fluttering in my own, and around our bodies surge the waters of life. Oh, actually, I did want to mention in that last poem, it, it, did, no, it did make me think the, the word faucet makes it pretty clear it's been translated into American English as opposed to British English. But it's an American press, so can't really follow that. <laughs> All right, awakening. The droplet will drop, tremble, run quietly down my body to share the freckles with calendula and cucumber peels. All year long I wade silver, shifting the drops from hand to hand. My skin is hot, eaten by metal, chapped by wind. What shall I do this morning? The wind tugs at my hair and runs across the sea, old wives howling. Thank you, grannies, for being with me. Thank you for going away. My heart resumes beating, my breath wraps up and marks the way. I am a woman, I am big. And I am still loving. I bow to cigarettes and wines, to one night's passions, to tender flesh, to tasteful friends who are on the level. I bow and I say my goodbye, it's time. You helped me, you dear ones, loved ones. You saw me off to the seashore. You held my hand and my hair while the sky broke into pieces, while I was afraid, while I looked at everyone like in a mirror. Now I am awake, now I am going. Thank you for being with me, but don't come along. I have to go and be human. I have the eaten away skin of being human. I have the torn up heart of being human. This one's called Easter. Imagine that you are a homosexual man in Uganda or a graying merchant of doves in Jerusalem one moment before everything is fulfilled. Imagine that you are a child seeing from the dark of the past your parents lying about your death. Imagine that you are this child's mother who has experienced something worse than hearing that her man is her 10 year old daughter's husband. Imagine that you are a woman in India, thrown off the bus along with her boyfriend. Imagine what grows there along the side of the road, what roots, what little bugs crawl over you, the throbbing of your life at the tips of your fingers, at the ends of your hair, while your soul remains silent, your soul remains silent, little cat's feet of blood, the sinewy arm of your lover the sun's sweltering caress. You open your eyes, red mist under one eyelid. A road stretches into the distance. In the sultry heat, it looks as if someone is coming. Red mist coats the eyelid. Children flutter above the dust clouds. People gather to take a look at who is the fallen today. People gather a stone under every arm. Little cat's feet of blood, the sinewy arm of your lover, the sun's sweltering caress. Your shadow leaning over you. Too early, too early, too early. A black shadow falls from the cross. The sun cannot get through. A little breath for your final moan. Three days pass, silence. Next to a body covered with stones stands a murderer's mother. Imagine that it happens daily. Nails, bones, vinegar, moans. From the dark you have entered this wedding and no one looks you in the eye. Not enough time remains to throw you out. Paste crosses on windows. Everyone buy provisions for the apocalypse. You listen, somewhere in the billowy darkness, four winds are harnessed by lightning. So, yeah, I enjoyed this one. And four out of five, as I said. So I'm going to go and continue to wave my flag some more. But in the meantime, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this. Leave a comment to let me know what you think about this book. Do buy a copy if uh, it sounds interesting to you. Because, you know, poetry is hard to sell at the best of times. So it would be very much appreciated. And, um, yeah. Pal this and I will see you in another one. Bye bye.
Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to do a quick review of 18 by Pauls Bankowskis. So this is translated from Latvian by Jeva Lasinska, and this is actually part of a series of books that all kind of cover different parts of Latvia's history. So this is technically, I guess, historical fiction. It's set in 1918, which is when Latvia first declared independence. It actually had to fight off the Germans and the Russians to maintain that independence as well. Published by Vagabond Voices. And um, yeah, this is one of several books that after my little trip to Latvia, I thought I would check out. So I'm going to read the blurb to you. Whilst visiting their holiday home in the country, a family discovers a digital camera in the pocket of their grandfather's overcoat. As their grandfather was well past taking photos or even travelling to the country at the time digital cameras became available, its presence in his pocket, stored in an old leather case no less, is mysterious. Almost as mysterious as the images on the camera. Pictures that he couldn't possibly have taken. Pictures of the country home from impossible angles. All of which seem to contain blurry, illuminated suggestions of a humanoid shape. Nearly a century earlier, amidst the chaos wrought by the Russian Revolution, a Latvian soldier deserts his post and travels the country by foot, recording his many strange experiences in a small journal that he keeps hidden in his boot. His encounters with various characters lead him to develop theories on space, time, freedom, and what it means to be human. He wonders, what if time is layered like a stack of pancakes? And what if a tree with roots and branches that grow expansively in every direction enjoys an ideal, perfectly balanced sort of freedom? The backdrop to this novel is a pivotal moment in Latvian history, but its scope is much broader. Bankowski's story presents a wonderful exploration of what it means to be human and the ways in which civilization's many products can alienate us from the natural world and from ourselves, while simultaneously driving us back into nature's embrace. And I don't know how to really explain this one because it almost feels as though nothing happens in the entire book. The stuff about finding this digital camera with the photos on, I never quite understood the significance of that, it never really got explained. I don't think, or if it did, it was at the point at which my kind of attention had started to wonder. So, while it was interesting to read the kind of the the writings of this Latvian soldier as he wandered around, it felt the point of this book was less about all these pictures and even the backdrop of the revolution, and more about these theories on space, time, freedom, and what it means to be human. So, while it is a novel and it's like something's happening, it actually kind of felt as though, you know, some old stoner guy was telling you, like, <laughs> he was like, well, I've got this great theory on this, I've got this great theory on that. So it was kind of theory after theory, with with not much plot tying it together, and I think that was a deliberate part on the from the point of view of the author, but... It fa I found it quite hard to relate to it in any way. I didn't get much of a sense of who the characters were. I guess I got a bit of a sense of Latvia itself as a country, but not as much as I was expecting, I don't think. And I was expecting, I guess, more of the historical backdrop and less of being told that time's like a pancake. Time isn't like a pancake. I don't, I don't believe. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'd, how would you... You know what I mean? It's just... It was very odd, and the writing style was quite difficult as well. I'm not saying it was a bad book, I'm just saying it definitely wasn't what I expected. If I don't think this had been planned out at all, it's like a stream of consciousness ramble almost. So this is the 21st of August 1917, and I'll read you a little bit here. So, A moment after we said goodbye to each other, there was great commotion when a German shell fell right there on, on Alexander Street, followed by two more. In an instant, the street was empty. At the intersection, the water main had been hit and a fountain of water shot up into the air. A building had lost its facade, revealing a dresser, a bed, and a painting on one of the remaining walls. A Rosenthal, if I am not mistaken. A crowd soon began to gather. I couldn't forget my brief conversation with M, which bothered me until I reached my first destination. Miss M's political views notwithstanding, she regarded me as a traitor. Her political sympathies were unknown to me at the time, yet her mood was not hard to guess. Only later, many years later, did I find out that first she had been an active social democrat and then, after the founding of the Latvian state, she had been arrested for anti-government activities. When the Soviet regime was set up in 1940, she became an active collaborator, only to disappear in Siberia a few years later. And what's weird is that these little kind of postscripts that I guess are meant to have been written by the diary author after the diary entry, they're, they're more interesting than the diary itself. So, 
you get this sense of while well, very little is happening in this story, actually this these shells falling. I think even the author mentioned in his afterword, he was like, I deliberately put that at the start so that all the action would be at the start. And it's not even <laughs> that much action. But then you just get the point, the view that like all of this interesting stuff is happening in this world. But the author's like, no, nah, you don't want to hear about that. No, nah, no, nah, let me tell you more about my pancake theory. And I, d I don't want to hear about the pancake theory. We have some reflections on war here. So it says, uh, in addition to all the other things it has made unrecognizable or completely destroyed, this war must have changed man's ability to distinguish between speed and slowness, haste and thoroughness. When you look back on the history of warfare, everything depended on speed. When foot soldiers turned out to be too slow, cavalry and the chariot were invented. Man realized that in order to win in battle, often reckless, not to say monstrous, speeds are required. Firearms, navy, armor trains, war, aeroplanes, and dirigibles. They were all attempts to surprise an unprepared adversary, to be quicker than the enemy. Yet ways of conducting war became dated almost as quickly as ladies' summer fashions. For example, the Dvinsk Force Trust was under construction in 1812, when a battle with Napoleon's army took place outside its walls. All the efforts expended on building such fortified structures were wasted, as armies could simply circumvent them. The fortress was never completed. War conducted in this manner was proving to be too slow. I suspect that this hankering for speed and the need of an element of surprise in warfare infects us in all other undertakings, both in everyday life as well as in art and culture. People are increasingly and persistently harassed and therefore become more negligent. Even music, as was obvious at the end of the last century, is becoming ever faster and louder. And there are only a handful of people bothered that the ability to delve into things, observe what is happening around us and inside oneself, and contemplate and judge seems to be dwindling equally fast. Various means of transportation, telegraph, telephone, phonograph, cinema and newspapers, which are the instruments of immediacy making every event suddenly available and consumable for our entertainment, are not only reflections of our feverish haste, but also its agents. More, bigger, faster. Only that has, and will have in the future, some weight. But they say that you can't run past your own grave. The infamous Titanic was the dark angel of this trend, the whale-like sarcophagus and temple. I don't know, I think it's just the style, it's a bit overwritten to me, it's just... Like, I, dr I drift off in the middle of sentences, I'm actually finding it easier to read The Odyssey, which is my bedside book. I'm finding it re easier to read that and follow what's happening in that than in this, because... Again, because it's quite stream of consciousness, it jumps around a lot of the pl over the place. You get a lot of this like weird philosophy that maybe if you were Latvian, you might agree with it some more. But again, it just reminds me of like just being drunk in a pub and someone being like, you know what? I'm coming back to time being like a pancake. Time is like a pancake. Just a little bit at the end. And this is another example that I was finding the bits at the end of these sections where it said what af what happened to people afterwards. That was kind of more interesting, so I never saw Tidrikis after that. Several years later, I found out that in the winter of 1919, he was captured by the Bolsheviks, who beat and tortured him as a vicious reprisal and eventually abandoned him tied to a tree in the forest where he froze to death. And I just find it weird that the entire section before that just didn't really engage me at all and then this one short paragraph at the end of it where something kind of actually happens got me quite excited and we have this bit with madame uh, madame b and she talks about vegetarianism and i'm a vegetarianism veg i'm a vegetarianism so I, th I thought i thought i might find it relatable but even then i'm just a bit like uh, what, are you, what are you even saying so uh, a strong man like yourself might wonder why i feed you a meal without meat she said I have been observing vegetarianism for many years and believe me, a meatless meal provides a person with all that is needed, and the power concealed in it is even greater than in animal products. No creature need be killed for a person to be well fed. This simple truth is particularly important to remember as we face this terrible war. After the meal, we returned to the salon where tea and nut cookies were served. Where were we? Madame B thought a moment. Oh yes, I was telling you about the age of Aquarius. We must keep in mind that this time can bring great achievements and unseen discoveries to mankind, but it may equally be the case that the knowledge and new discoveries end up with the forces of darkness, and power is usurped by a faction of renegades who do not believe in anything or anyone, and the age of darkness ensues. If I was eating food that somebody had given me and they started talking like that, I'd, I would not eat the food. I'd be like this... This person's gone crazy. Another big bit, and I suppose again, this is this big, this deep sort of philosophy that's that's in this book. But I just didn't agree with any of it. So 
I must say that even before this, I had sometimes felt that the thoughts of all, or nearly all, people in this world are somehow connected by a kind of invisible and very fine web. And as soon as something happens at an intersection of this web, for instance an attack on Franz Ferdinand, news of this travels throughout the entire web, affecting both people nearby and those who live in a faraway corner of the world. Perhaps this invisible web or veil connects not only people but all other living beings or even inanimate objects, trees in the forest, leaves of grass, grains of sand, rocks in a field, the current in the river that ceaselessly flows past us. It can be called different names, soul, spirit, perhaps even some god. However, it is not the name that is important, but the great totality of the world where the tiniest bug and the greatest of men have something in common. And that to me just sounds like the kind of thing that people tell themselves to make them feel better about the futility of existence. And it reminds me of, uh, of, of Paolo Coelho, the alchemist, where they're talking about like the law of nature or whatever, and it's like... Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I just didn't really know what to make of this book. I... I don't know, I feel as though it's the kind of book where maybe you you have to be Latvian to understand it properly, maybe? In which case you might be better off just not reading the translated version, going with the original. It, it's, it was just very sort of hallucinatory and dreamlike, but I, I think I've read books where it's been done better, if that makes sense, and I don't tend to like that in general. I like, I like to feel as though there's some purpose to it, whereas... This book, if you ask me what this book is about, even now, all I, all I could tell you is it's the ramblings of a soldier. <laughs> like a ramblings of a des deserter, basically. And his weird philosophies. But if you ask me in two weeks what this is about, I'm not going to remember. I actually need to hurry up and finish my wrap-up so that I can give it a give it a review. I just don't think it's going to stick in my head at all. And out of the Latvian books that I've read so far, this is probably my least favourite, and I, I don't think I would recommend it, unless you like the sound of it. But anyway, rating time, I gave it, I think I gave it a 3.5 out of 5, no, I'm, I did, but I'm going to lower that rating. I'm going to give it a, a 3 out of 5, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it per se, I just didn't find it to be particularly enjoyable, there was nothing in it for me to really relate to either. Like, if anything... The, the, the best part of it for me was reading the weird philosophies and then debunking them in my own head, if that makes sense. But anyway, that's about it. So uh, be sure to let me know what you think by dropping a comment. Hit the like button if you've enjoyed this review. Hit the subscribe button if you're new here and you would like to see more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Today, I am watching Cortagonist talk about her cozy mystery rating system. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of this little Baltic comics magazine, issue number 27. So, obviously there are many different issues of this comic, but what I wanted to share about it really is something I picked up during my trip to Riga in Latvia to learn more about Latvian literature, and it's got, I think, about 30 different authors and illustrators. Let me show you here on the title page. It's actually so short it's not going to go into focus, but as you can see the artwork is super kawaii and I wanted to show some of the different stories and just share a few thoughts on it I guess. So I'm going to start by reading the little blurb here. This is the January 2017 issue. There are literally dozens of these issues available and if you're going to buy one you don't necessarily need to buy this issue. But um, I wanted to do it because it's a pretty good indicator of what they're like and um, some of them are, I mean they're just so, so you know, beautiful, beautiful little object. So, the blurb. A snake with a fedora hat, a chain-smoking centipede, and a cat who smashes cell phones. Ah, stop. No, this was an introduction to a previous issue. As only our very best friends read it, we're sure we'd get away with using the same one again. If you've read this far, you must be a very good friend as well. We hope you'll enjoy the bittersweet BFF comics we've collected for you. If not, lick some funny flowers together with your best friends and everything will be fine. So... For example, this is the very first one. You can see the art style there. And um, it reminds me almost of like a poetry chat book, but with, uh, but you know, it's a graphic novel effectively. And um, some of them are really surreal. Some of them are quite literal. Some of them have kind of a story arc. Some of them don't even have any dialogue or anything like that. So this one here, you can see two of the different art styles next to each other. So one is black and white, very minimalist, and another one is very colorful. And some of it's in a very basic style as well, but that 
isn't necessarily a problem. You know, it does feel, it feels like a zine, but a high quality zine, if that makes sense. The English wasn't always great in it though, so for example here we have the line, should we just less invite him? This is actually a story about a man who's addicted to twerking, let me show you. Look, he's twerking. And they're like, Fifi, open the door, and he shouts, leave me alone. This is another very odd one, it's a man whose like, stomach also has a face. Also, like the guy with the face and the stomach actually, he has to deliver a presentation and he says, mm, Okay guys, let me begin firing off an easy question. How many of you owns a thing like this? He's pointing to a cat. Then they say, yes, I own a cat. I actually own three. And then he's thinking, they confirmed my opening question. I have tightened my grip on the audience. Guys, this will never work out. If we want any yield out of this presentation, we are forced to recontextualize. We need to rethink presentation, redefine the term. Guys, what is a presentation? And then they all go outside and get naked and <laughs> someone goes, this presentation seems immensely relevant. So like I said, it's just a super cute little thing. I'm not sure again how easy these are to buy, but if you, if you are into comics and whatnot, I would definitely check them out. Again, here's some more of the fan, just the art style. It's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Even the ones that are written, you know, and drawn kind of like this. This almost reminds me of kind of Beavis and Butthead or something. Can't actually get that in focus, but you know. Some of them are like this, where I literally had no idea what is supposed to be going on. Let me show you the next page of that. If you can tell me in the comments what's happening here, you know, you're a better comic reader than I am. But again, that's what I really like, is that there's such a variety of different stuff. Here we have Simone and Pumba saying we don't give a fuck in that bottom corner there. But you know, those are actually really well well drawn. And then some of these, this is like almost deconstructed in its style. So again, I think I paid, I only paid maybe three or four euros for this. And for what it is, it's just, you know, crazy. Like, look at this. So even though the writing itself... In, and the English that was used wasn't necessarily amazing for for creativity and whatnot. You've got to you've got to give it high marks anyway. There's this one guy here, and he's done all of his pieces. This is like yarn look. He's made these people out of yarn. What's interesting actually is not all these artists or anything are from Latvia. Um, they're from like they're international artists and whatnot. I'll check in the author bios in a bit. Here's the one about a blob. And the blob's getting bullied, so someone shouts, Hey Blob, where's your mum, Blob? Did she leave because you're so ugly? And Blob says, No, she had cancer. She died from cancer. And the bully says, I bet she killed herself because she hated you, Blob. Here we go. Some nice more artwork. Very kawaii. Very kawaii. Let's have a look here at the authors. So we have New Zealand, India, Spain, Mexico, Norway, the UK, Portugal, Japan, Switzerland, USA, Latvia, France, Brazil, Austria, France, Algeria, USA, China, Germany, and Denmark as our contributors. So yeah, all in all, I'm gonna give this, I'm gonna give it a four out of five. Like I say, the English isn't perfect, but because it does have this kind of zine-like feel, that almost doesn't matter. If you're into art and visual stuff, you're gonna absolutely love this. And because there is such a, you know, there's a huge collection of these magazines all for different issues, and a lot of the back issue ones are still available, you know, check online and see if you can find some of these, and uh, maybe buy a bulk pack if, if they look interesting to you. So yeah, there we have it. That's what I thought of Baltic Comics Magazine number 27. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this review. I've been trying to keep it a little bit shorter, but at the same time I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a flip through of the magazine, I suppose. And hit that like button if you've enjoyed this. Hit subscribe if you're new here and you would like to see more. And I'll see you soon in another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.